Um, we're going to move into the core discussion to help really frame these issues in a practical way. What does accountability really look like? What are the major challenges that we need must overcome to get there? What do we actually need to do? And we have three outstanding panelists to talk about this. We've got El Hodge Al Si, who's the chair of the board of the Kofi Annan Foundation, the co-chair of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, former leader of the IFRC. We have Ms. Gabriela Cuevas Baron, who's the president of the Interparliamentary Union. And we have um, Dr. Kwatea Hiwain, who is Civil Society Engagement Mechanism, UHC 2030, and Executive Director of the Center for Supporting Community Development Initiatives in Vietnam. So voices from around the world. And before I'd like to start, I'd like to start you off by very quickly asking you all to tell us where you're physically speaking from, because these are extraordinary times where everyone is having to essentially improvise, myself included. I'm in a study. Um, and tell us briefly where you're talking from. And can you give us one quick example, very clearly, of how accountability appeared in your life recently or didn't appear, if you like? So let's start with Mr. Asse and then go on to Ms. Cuevas and Dr. Owan. Hello, uh, good afternoon uh, from uh, Geneva, where I'm speaking uh, uh, out of a hotel. I was supposed to be in Dakar, Senegal right now, which is my home. But given uh, the restriction, travel restriction due to COVID-19, I still cannot travel. Hopefully, I'll be able to do so in the next days to come. Until then, I'm stuck here and connecting uh, live with you, you know, from uh, Geneva. Well, accountability is uh, above all delivering on promises that are made. And that's what will bring trust. That trust will be compliance and that will bring, you know, support. So uh, recently, you know, we've seen uh, in the uh, uh, Ebola outbreak, you know, in uh, West Africa, as well as in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, where there was accountability and trust in leadership, we saw good response and good community response. Where it was lacking, we saw those gaps and disparities being exacerbated. And uh, the price of inaction in the past was extremely high for the present. And this is one of the le lessons that we need to learn, that to deserve the trust and support of communities, we have to be accountable. And being accountable means to deliver on the promises we make to people. Thank you, Mr. Asai. Ms. Cuevas, where are you talking from? Hello, hello from Mexico City. We are also in kind of lockdown here, not with that uh, very big restrictions, but uh, here we are in the middle of the pandemic. So I, I fully understand all the restrictions that many people are living all around the world. And that also is reflected in, in accountability. For example, just a couple of months ago, two billion people were living in countries where parliaments were restricted or totally suspended. And um, if we try to, to summarize what is accountability, institutionalizing accountability entails having a clarity on knowing both how and why our resources spent and to what extent has then been progress in terms of concrete, tangible uh, results. Accountability means that we, in our case as parliamentarians, but that goes to all public offices, we represent the people and we must deliver uh, meaningful, substantive results. Parliaments are the, the very important institution in terms of accountability. First, for ourselves, we need to work together with the people that we represent with our constituencies and explain them how are we using their voice in parliaments to deliver legislation, to allocate budget. But the other way for accountability is working with government. Sometimes accountability is seen like an eternal fight between the parliament and the government. And that is not always that way. Of course, public political debate is important because that's the nature of a parliament. But it also builds the bridge to work together 
to have parliaments and governments working into one direction. And I think that we have a lot of examples during this pandemic where governments were uh, held by the, the parliaments. And also we can see a lot of different examples. For example, investing in parliament space off. In Uganda with the IPU's assistance, assistance, the parliament introduced a bill on maternal, newborn and children health. Uh, we can have also some other uh, important practices uh, for good and not that for good. Um, right. right, well, thank you. Um, Dr. Wayne, you are speaking, I believe, from Vietnam, but tell me if I'm correct. And of course, Vietnam is, has been part of Asia, which has been at the leading edge of COVID-19. Um, where are you talking from and how is it? Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. I'm speaking from a hotel in the central coast of Vietnam. I am actually on holiday with my family. So this is, I'm in my hotel room. Um, so we don't have any uh, community transmission of COVID-19 uh, for the last uh, maybe 12 weeks. So we can travel within the country by plane and train and anything. Um, so that that's a situation here that allow us to travel within the country, but still not abroad, yes. Um, as an example of accountability, um, my NGO has been um, doing a COVID-19 uh, uh, relief program to provide food to the homeless people and to the people who are in the most difficult situation who uh, may risk of, um, uh, hunger during the lockdown. Um, and uh, we need to be accountable to uh, reach the people who need uh, the food the most and we also need to be accountable to the people who donate to us because that's um where we get the donation from individuals and groups in the country during the lockdown so that we are able to um, um to do the work that to distribute the food to people um so that is an example of accountability of the the closest example that um i can share uh, about our work Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm sure many of us feel jealous that you've been going on holiday um, wherever we're sitting in the world, because that's not possible in many parts of the world at the moment. But let's turn back to the IAP recommendations. And the first recommendation was for urgent investment in country data systems for national and global security. I'd like to ask, first of all, Mr. Alsai, in your experience of trying to support countries to prevent and respond to humanitarian and conflict situations, how has the data issue played out for you? I mean, have there been moments when you've seen effective examples of how to use data systems or times when you think it's been not so effective? And how does that affect the COVID um, question in relation to women and children's health? So uh, data is extremely important, but um, we often use data in a quite uh, global you know, way. And uh, there must be a disaggregation you know, of that data you know, at the local level, the furthest local level. It must be also a disaggregation alongside you know, gender, you know, age, you know, different vulnerable groups that are facing different risks. The lack of that you know, will uh, lead us you know, to you know, leave people behind. And we hear all these slogans of today, let's walk the last mile, Let's make sure that nobody is left behind. But it will not happen, you know, without you know good data. There is only, and I rarely use the word only in these kind of settings, a way to truly address in an inclusive manner the you know, needs of people is to be there where the needs are greatest. And in order to do that, you need really to have the guidance, you know, to have the data. We've seen, for example, that the best use of data has shown us that people with disability are often, uh, often left you know, behind or totally excluded, totally out of the loop. We have seen also, uh, because of lack of data, we have global approaches that do not take into account the real needs of women and children, while we know for a fact that shocks and hazards in humanitarian situations disproportionately affect you know women and girls and then children people with disability disability 
And in some instances, also depending on the data and the profile that we see in our elderly people. So if we take that into account, then we will make sure that, for example, with a good use of data, you know, in uh, humanitarian settings, we make sure that the way that aid is distributed take into account, you know, the need of women and the elderly and disabled people that could not run into the shelters, that could not line up, you know, to take uh, humanitarian supplies. And that data allow us, you know, to uh, bring new innovations such as good trans uh, cash transfer programs, early warning and early alert system, and even uh, what is called, you know, a forecast-based financing to respond, you know, to that. A uh, but uh, not a good uh, uh, consideration of data is to, uh, for example, uh, put like we used to do in the past, uh, sanitation facilities uh, without taking into account the particularly need, you know, of young girls in schools. And of course, if we do not have a specific uh, sanitation facilities for them they will not be able to come to school during a menstruation period, for example. And these are extremely important issues, you know, that can only be addressed, you know, when the data is disaggregated. But all that will boil down to, again, the issue of accountability and good governance that we've talked about. We are not all equal uh, in the face, you know, of these challenges, even though we are all affected, to make sure then we understand the needs of everybody that is best illustrated by good use of data and the application of accountability through the commitment to respond to that. It is not just, you know, to make the case by using data. It is now doing something about the case by acting and committing and justifying like the report is recommended. So with good data, you can basically illuminate inequity, but then you have to obviously then act on it as well, not just illuminate it. And that, of course, brings in the question, as you say, of governance and the role of politicians and parliaments. So I'd like to ask um, Ms. Cuevas, um, in terms of your role as leader of the IPU, um, you know, how do you see this actually playing into the issue of getting more accountability? And what does institutionalizing accountability even mean um, if you actually get the data in the first place? Well, of course, we need to take decisions based on data. We cannot continue with these kind of practices using sometimes beautiful, sometimes awful narratives to build a political speech or a, or a public policy. We need data. We need to have uh, concrete actions on a clear reality. First of all, parliaments are, again, they need to be accountable with our constituencies, with the people that we represent, because that's the most important mandate of a parliament, of a parliamentarian. Second, we need to understand that we have also an international responsibility, and these international and regional commitments are not well uh, overseen in terms of some parliaments do not, have, do not have any powers in terms of, of uh, for example, foreign policy or uh, ratifying these instruments, but they must be engaged because now the problems are getting more and more global and we need also common uh, global solutions. So accountability mechanisms must be adapted and exercised at the national level for parliaments to be uh, able to effectively uh, exercise oversight. Second, we observe that parliaments often lack the capacities and resources to systematically scrutinize the government action. Uh, the, the powers for a, for a parliament for a specialized committee sometimes are not enough to deliver a, prop, a proper research or investigation. Thirdly, oversight remains a political activity. Even so, the political room for maneuver in oversight matters might be limited. This is still true with clear mandates and mechanisms. And I think that, uh, again, parliaments must be working on one side, yes, with the people, on the other side, with the government. But we cannot forget that also parliament needs to be more representative in order to be more accountable. Now, only 24.5 of the total world seats in parliament are for women. That is not representative. That is not inclusive. If we go to youth, people under 30 years old, only have 2.2% of the total seats in Parliament. 
And sometimes we believe that if we incorporate, for example, public opinion, that could be enough. And I don't think so. There are some parliaments with very clear mechanisms that are making a very good step forward. For example, Cyprus, they created an, an open parliament where people and the different specialized groups can participate and present proposals. Or for example, Rwanda, they presented with the IPU a sexual and reproductive health bill, uh, bill that they started working with within the parliament as they should, but also at the grassroots levels, at the communities, with all their constituencies. And that makes not only an easier process for a bill, but also a more accountable, a more transparent one. And of course, the implementation of this new legislation becomes much easier. Right. Are there any other mechanisms that can actually make Parliament more accountable that we ought to think about, do you think? Yes, and I think that one is the uh, I think good sides that we can learn from this pandemic. The use of these technologies, for example, these platforms, uh, more social media, technology is moving very fast uh, due to the pandemic and we can use it to have more open parliaments and of course more transparent and more accountable one. In this regard, I would like to explain for some institutions, being accountable only means to make public the accounts, the numbers of or the budgets of that institution. But being accountable means not only about budgets, it is about actions, it's about decisions, it's about being fully transparent and fully inclusive. And yes, parliaments have a lot to do, but I am sure that we can incorporate very good practices in terms of open parliament to, uh, through technology and social media. Right, right. Well, thank you. Dr. Wine, as we just heard, COVID-19 has hit vulnerable populations and marginalized populations particularly hard. Given the experience of working with HIV, the crisis there, with um, sex workers, with all the drug users and see, um, women's issues that you've been watching over the recent years, what do you think the real key to making sure that we actually tackle the issue of vulnerability and exclusion are and actually fulfill the long-term goals of UHC? Um, yeah, I think actually, um, first of all, we need to, uh, the, the leader of the world and of the country should just implement the UHC, the Universal Health Coverage Political Declaration because that is the most comprehensive health declaration that emphasizes the principle of leaving no one behind, reaching the furthest behind first. And the, the USC political declarations also covers emergency preparedness agenda. It was in September last year, even before COVID-19 pandemic. So if the world just implemented we be in quite good place um, also to address the need of the vulnerable and marginalized population, but also to prepare for COVID-19 or any other um, pandemic. Um, but as the country uh, implement the universal health coverage, we would like to ask that um, the USC have to be truly universal in all three dimensions, services, population and financial protections because health services as pointed out in USC definition should be in a full spectrum from health promotion, prevention to treatment and rehabilitation and population dimension should ensure the equity principle that the people left further behind are covered first and financial protection should ensure that every person, including the people who are most left behind, can afford healthy lifestyle and preventive measure and treatment, etc. Um, this, the, the other thing is that we need sustainable and res, uh, resilient systems for health. And by systems here, I mean the system blurs with an S. Um, that should include health system and community systems. Why health system uh, get a lot, of, a lot of attention as it rightly so. Less attention and investment is paid to community system. The truth is that without an inclusive and strong community system, the needs of the people marginalized are not identified, their voice are not heard, 
and they don't have opportunity to contribute. So we do not only film them, but we also miss their life experience. We miss the uh, their contribution. And the um the the last point I would like to say about to this is about the governance of emergency response, such as the pandemic response. Um, a close example is the the COVID nineteen response. The governance of such a responses should include the view of civil society and community. So um the a CSAM, a civil society engagement mechanism of USC 2030, recently did a survey on the um, civil society and community participation in COVID-19 response. So all those organization respond, and we found that civil society, uh, society respond um, in, the early, uh, in the early stage is largely um, independent from the government. So it's not coordinated society and community are either absent or marginal in community in the country um, respond and so right. the, the leave here and the community are largely explore and and we don't know who makes the decisions so um yeah well thank you dr wine and that's a lot of great points you've made there i would love to keep on talking to all of you and get more feedback and comment on what, what each of you have said but sadly, very sadly, we are almost out of time and we're going to have to move on to the next section. 